Thank you for the invitation to come to your community here in Pennsylvania and talk to you about the environmental and human health impacts of shale gas development. Up here you see that I'm listed as Earthworks and Earthworks Oil and Gas Accountability Project. I was a founding member of the Oil and Gas Accountability Project, which is housed in Durango, Colorado. And at the time, it dealt with oil field waste and coal bed methane development. And then we were rolled over into Earthworks, and so I'm now a board member of Earthworks. I wear many hats. My other hat is I'm president of Super Company, which provides technical assistance to community groups dealing with environmental issues. And I started Super Company in 1981, so it's been 31 years of providing technical assistance to community groups, helping them understand what the issues are, and letting them make the decisions for their community. And so I want to tell you that no matter what kind of technical assistance you bring to the community groups, the community group has got to make their own decisions. Frequently, someone will try and help a group and say, and this is what you have to do, and this is what you have to ask for. And that's not where it is. It's the community making the decisions. So tonight I bring you information about shale gas and shale gas around the United States. And then I'll give you some specific information about what is going on here in Pennsylvania. So as I go through the presentation, it's a combination of data from Pennsylvania and Texas and Louisiana and Wyoming and North Dakota and Ohio and New York and a bunch of other areas where shale gas is. But, and then we'll focus for a few minutes on Pennsylvania. So this is, quote, the shale gas plays in the local 48 United States. There are now 20 states where there is shale gas development occurring. This map gets updated almost weekly with a new state and a new shale gas development. In Louisiana, you see the Haynesville Shale. It's in North Louisiana by the city of Shreveport. Recently, the Tuscaloosa Shale started being developed for shale gas. The Haynesville is gas. The Tuscaloosa is oil and gas. Y'all had Calvin Tillman and Tim talk to y'all. They live on top of the Barnett, so you see here the Barnett is around the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and it is all gas. Since Tim and Calvin became involved, there's been a great rush to do the uh, shale gas along the Mexican border. Eagle Ford, or as they say in Texas, Eagle Ford, and it is both oil and gas. As we rode around today and saw the damage and destruction that's occurring in your area. The one thing that was missing is yours is only gas. And if it was oil, there'd also be huge, huge storage tanks. There are storage tanks, but they'd be huge storage tanks for oil. But other than that, it's the same story everywhere. So this is a map to show where conventional where you drill for oil, like in the old days. You did two-dimensional seismic, three-dimensional seismic, and you thought there was a pool underground. And so that's where you aim for it. And you might hit the pool, or you might have gone right on the edge of it. In the case of shale gas, it's a formation. And so they know where it is. The question is, not whether it's going to produce, but how much it produces. So in the old days, you leased your property, and if they didn't hit, they went away and probably never drilled another well. In the shale gas, they hit every time, and they make the decision whether or not to produce that well based on cost, what the product is 
costs at the time, and then how much it's producing. Is it worth producing? So here you see they drill down, and you, very, very deep, 5,000 to 8,000 feet. And this drilling down to that depth was not economically feasible when natural gas was cheap. When the price of natural gas went up, it suddenly became economically feasible. So they drill down and then turn horizontally and then fracture the formation because it's a very tight formation. And if they don't fracture it, it doesn't open up. If they fracture it, they prop it open with sand and that allows the gas to flow up the piping and back to the surface. So backing up a little bit, in the 1980s, there were some rules and regulations passed in DC, and there were a number of waste streams or kinds of waste that were called the bevel waste streams, and they were given an exemption from being regulated as hazardous until a special report was done, which was called Damage Cases to Congress, so that you could identify human health and environmental damage from that industry. And then Congress would make a decision whether or not to regulate that waste stream as hazardous or non-hazardous. So here you see it enjoys the federal exemption because the damage case to Congress on oil and gas waste had two kinds of waste. They had the large volume low toxicity and the small volume high toxicity. And the recommendation was that low volume high toxicity should be regulated as hazardous and the other stream as non-hazardous. That recommendation was made to Congress and then a few weeks later, that was removed, and the recommendation was leave it all as non-hazardous. If you analyze the samples of the waste by the hazardous waste characteristics, 10 to 70% of that large volume waste is hazardous by analysis. 40 to 60% of that waste of the low volume high toxicity is hazardous. But it's regulated as non-hazardous, and the recommendation was that only states should regulate oil and gas waste. So this is a chart that shows you the Marcellus, which is what you have under Pennsylvania, and then the Barnett, which is where Calvin and Tim live, except now Calvin lives off of the shale. And remember, if you can find a location off of the shale, you frequently improve your quality of life and health. And then the Eagle Ford, which is in the, north, the southern part of Texas. And as you see, they're very, very deep formations. So they cost a lot of money to drill down. And then you put the fracturing fluid in, which you add a whole bunch of chemicals we'll talk about in a minute. And you put it down the well. And not all of it comes back up to the surface, meaning it stays in the formation. So in Marcellus, 20 to 30 percent remains underground with all its toxic chemicals. The Barnett's the same thing, 20 to 30 percent. And the Eagle Ford, all of it, for the most part, stays underground. So you've introduced all of that toxic waste stream into the formation underground. The fracturing fluids, it takes three to eight million gallons of water per day. So today we, heard, we saw a bunch of cavit Cabot Wells, we went out to the Dimmick area and the Susquehanna County. And each one of the signs in front had a number on how much water maximum they would use on a daily basis. And the interesting thing was every single well pad, no matter how many wells it had on it, had that same number. So. My guess is that they're asking for the maximum amount per day to be able to use in those wells. In Louisiana, you can take as much water as you want from groundwater or surface water. You don't have to report it, and you don't have to pay for it. You just take it and bring it to the fracking well and do whatever you want with it. So when we look at the development of shale gas and the 
horizontal drilling and fracturing. We have this fluid, this fracking fluid that they make up. And when they add all the chemicals, not counting the sand, 60 to 160 tons of chemicals are added to the fracking fluid they put down the well. That's a huge quantity. When they talk to you about it, they say it's only 1%, mostly water and just 1% chemicals. So let's look at the kind of chemicals that are there. Surfactants, surface tension depressants, lauryl sulfate, friction reduces. They want to reduce the friction between the flowback water and the casing. Polysaccharides, biocides, because if bacteria start growing, they cause a problem downhole. And then scale inhibitors, because if it starts scaling up, it's going to plug the formation that you just fractured. Corrosion inhibitors, so that the casing stays OK. And then breakers, and then those propping agents. For the most part, it's sand. But these ceramic beads, there's a place in New Iberia, where I'm from, that makes these ceramic beads. And they sound like it's just glass. Well, they use very toxic heavy metals and make these beads very strong so the formation doesn't crush the beads. And their emissions into the air from the manufacturing process are horrible. They were in business for quite a few years. And then when the gas prices went down, they shut the business down. Now that shale is all over the United States, they've opened back up and they're even expanding. So we are making a lot of the ceramic beads that you're seeing used on some of the sites in this area. So the flowback water is the fracturing fluid that goes down the well, fractures open under pressure, the formation, and then what part comes back. And it consists of that fracking fluid. And then it also picks up contaminants from the formation itself. So it doesn't just go down and come back up and don't have any new additives. It has naturally occurring radioactive material. You like that? It's norm. It sounds so normal. Mostly it's radium-226. Radium-226 has a half-life of 1,620 years. It's going to be there for a very, very long time. Production in Louisiana and production of the Marcellus shale are particularly hot with radioactivity. So this gets added to the fracking fluid and flows back as a contaminant in the flowback water. 20 to, again, 20 to 30 percent of the Marcellus and Barnett and 100 percent of the Eagle Ford stay underground, do not come back up. So then what else comes back up? Produce water, formation water, or brine. And this has been one of the things that comes to the surface with oil and gas. And what the industry has argued is they can't tell you how much flowback versus how much produced water, which they can if they wanted to, so that they just mix in the flowback water with the produced water and dispose of it in injection wells. Or they try and recycle it back to reuse for additional fracking. But Thursday night, we're having a hearing in Louisiana on an injection well that's just primarily for the flowback water. And it will be hugely more contaminated than the produced water. And it'll be outside the area of the shale gas. And the citizens don't want anyone else's waste coming into their community. So the volatile organics are in the produced water. And they consist of benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, and xylene. And anybody in the oil and gas industry knows that's the BTEX. But the, also, benzene is a known human cancer-causing agent, particularly causes leukemia. And then the semi-volatile organics, phenol and pyridine, semi-volatiles are very persistent. They're, they last in the environment a long time. They also bioaccumulate up the food chain. And then the toxic heavy metals, arsenic, barium, cadmium, chromium, lead, mercury, and vanadium. And we've had different conversations since I arrived in town last night about arsenic and mercury contamination. These are elements. They're not breaking down. They're going to be in the environment for a long, long time. So what else is produced water contaminated with? Sulfur compounds. And you hear the oil industry, oh, we don't have sulfur 
in our streams up in this area. I've, I've seen that on more than one application. Sulfur is the hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide is not a problem in this area. And then the norm, the radium-226, 228, and uranium-238. And those are particularly high in concentration in the Marcellus. And again, very long-lasting. And then the saltwater minerals, the volatile organics and the toxic heavy metals are known in possible cancer-causing agents and mutagens. And the radium-226 is a bone seeker and a known carcinogen causing lung and bone cancer. And the issues that were developed when radiation like 226 was first brought to mind is that it was scaling up in pipes and people were using it for swing sets and all types of structures, barbecue pits and fences. And the issue is that the industry said it wasn't a problem, but the medical doctors started seeing all these lung and bone cancer patients, particularly in pipeline, pipe yard workers, where they actually reamed out the scale. And they actually breathed it in, brought it home on their clothes. Their houses were totally contaminated. Their cars were totally contaminated. And in one case, we had a, a baby crawling on the floor. And we traced it all the way from his workplace to his home. And we got that facility shut down and had to be cleaned up. And we got the house decontaminated. But if we hadn't pushed the issue, he'd still have all that radiation in his home. So as part of the work I do, I interact a lot with the industry. I interact a lot with the Environmental Protection Agency, as you heard. I serve on a number of their committees representing the community's perspective. And dealing with the industry, this is what the industry has admitted, that they pollute the environment by releasing from shale gas drilling, fracturing, they also call it stimulation, and production. Spills and leaks, and they, this is what they admit. They contaminate surface water, groundwater resources, soils, and the air from spills and leaks. The cement around the casing that you saw go down the well, the cement fails and they contaminate groundwater, surface water, soil, and air. And the casing itself that they go down fails and they contaminate groundwater, surface water, soil, and air. They stop just short of admitting that they contaminate groundwater as a result of fracturing. And those of you who have been watching the EPA process, Congress delegated to EPA a mandate that they look and determine whether or not groundwater has been contaminated by fracking. And so that committee that he referred to that I chaired was the first of four committee meetings that we had, and that was dealing with the analytical procedures. And there are a number of test cases, and a number of those test case locations for that study are here in Pennsylvania. So pathways of exposure how you and your neighbors can be exposed. Inhalation, breathing in, and dermal skin contact from air emissions. The natural gas production, methane and associated hydrocarbons, and the con condensate. Now, I heard in this area it wasn't wet, so it didn't generate a lot of condensate. In other areas over the Marcellus, it's wet, so it generates a lot of condensate. So why is condensate a bad thing? Well, it's a good thing from the industry's perspective because they get a lot of money, a lot more money for the condensate than the gas. But if you look at the content of the condensate, it contains volatile organics, again, that benzene, a known human cancer-causing agent, xylene, toluene, ethylbenzene, other possible and probable cancer-causing agents, sulfur-based compounds. These chemicals are released into the air during production, during separation, during tank storage, and pipeline transportation. And today on our field trip, we saw a large number of pipelines going in. We saw compressor stations going in. And at the well sites where the shale is wet, you'll have the condensate tanks. But you also have the produced water tanks, 
which contain the flowback as well, and they will contain a large number of very toxic chemicals. So emissions into the air from produced water tanks on the production site. Someone was asking today, what are those tanks? It's where the produced water is stored, and it releases methane, toxic volatile organics, and sulfur compounds, and it releases them into the air because they don't want to spend the money to put vapor recovery systems on the tanks themselves. So there are hatches. Frequently, they leave the hatches open. If not, they vent. And in Louisiana, the requirement is that the vent has to go outside the contained area so that if it overflows and goes out the vent, it doesn't come back and cause the tank to explode. So it goes outside the contained area, leaks on the ground, and contaminates the soil, surface water, and groundwater. Natural gas is frequently vented to the air when a well is completed. If you've been watching the new EPA air regs, in three years they will require new wells only to put controls so that they call in a green completion. So the first well on a pad, usually you don't have a pipeline. So right now they either vent it or just or flare it. And they might bring in the second or the third well before they get a pipeline. Well, the new EPA regs say they have to have some kind of control technology. But again, it's only new wells, and it won't happen for three years. And then the compressors and the motors that drive all this process and the injection well disposal sites along the pipeline, a lot of combustible products and volatile organics. So what happens is the combustion products and the volatile organics and sunlight and heat equal ozone. So you have all the health impacts from ozone formation right around these well sites. Because it's prime. It's got the organics, it's nit the nitrogen oxide, it's got the heat, it's got the sunlight. But there isn't an ozone monitor there. You have the ozone monitors in the larger cities because those are the, quote, areas that generate a lot of ozone, but you're not going to have it out on drilling and production sites, and yet that's where you need it. So if you want to ever consider doing any monitoring, get a, a little cheap handheld ozone monitor and go out and monitor the ozone. If you start getting the respiratory problems in the middle of the day, in the middle of the afternoon, it could be as a result of ozone. So what are the actual health impacts? And these are health impacts not only from Pennsylvania, but Texas, from Louisiana, from Wyoming, from North Dakota. The acute are the short-term health impacts, the ones that occur as soon as you're exposed. These are people that live in close proximity to drilling, fracturing, and production wells. And this is the air, air pathway of exposure. Irritation to the skin, eyes, and nose, throat, and lungs. How many of you have had those symptoms? You must live by your side. You do. Headaches. Any of you have had headaches? She's going to be our victim tonight, one in the back. Dizziness, lightheadedness, nausea, skin rashes, fatigue, tense and nervous, personality changes, depression, anxiety, irritability, confusion, drowsiness, weakness. These are things that make life absolutely miserable. And yet the industry will say they're not having an impact on human health. And these are the acute impacts. So what are the chronic or the long-term exposure impacts? Damage to the liver and kidneys. And we had conversations about kidney damage appearing. Damage to the lungs. The nervous system causing weakness. Leukemia, remember that gets back to benzene aplastic anemia that gets back to benzene, changes in the blood cell, and impacts to blood clotting ability. So if you get any of these and you go to the doctor, is his first question going to be, how close do you live to a shale gas well or compressor or pipeline metering station? No, he's not going to ask you that. It's really, really critical to educate the medical profession so they start making the links. If you look back at those acute impacts, the respiratory impacts, when you go into a doctor for those, he's not going to ask you how close do you live near one of these facilities. He's going to say, I'll give you antibiotics. Come back in two weeks if you don't feel better. So 
the cause and effect are clearly there. Clearly there. But the medical community is one very reluctant to make that link. And in a lot of cases, they are also the medical doctor for the oil companies or the service companies. They do pre-employment pre physicals. They do accident. So the issue becomes where does most of their income come from and what happens if they start making that link and say, you know, what you have I think is linked to the well next door, the compressor station. Next. You heard Calvin talk about his 11 compressor stations that are like pearls on a string on the edge of town. Calvin got it. He knew what was causing the medical impacts. He moved. And he did a huge amount of advocacy work. But it was very difficult to get the medical community to pay attention to what was going on in his community and a lot of other communities. So these are the health impacts from both air and drinking water pathways near shale gas drilling, fracturing, and production sites. You see some of the same ones. 81% of the individuals surveyed had respiratory impacts. I do some presentations with Dr. Mark Mitchell of Connecticut. And in one community, I have 55% of the community that says they are ill. And he says, that is just unbelievable. He says, in a community that's 5 to 10% thinking they're ill is a huge, huge negative impact. And yet, I have 55%. Well, here we have 81% of the people surveyed had respiratory impacts. What does that do to the economy of the area if you can't go to work when you have the respiratory impacts? It makes a huge, huge difference. If you look at the American Lung Association's website on air emissions, they'll do calculations on loss wages days. So also we have memory loss. And it's nothing like living with someone that has memory loss that is driving you up a tree. I asked you, honey, and you didn't do it. I gave you two days to do it. Why didn't you do it? And honey goes like, I don't even remember you asking me. So a lot of the spouses start doing tabs with instructions. This is what you need to do. Because that memory loss is just making it unbearable to live in the house with someone who has memory loss. That's young. It's not an elderly person. So then you get into the anxiety and you get into the depression. Feeling weak and tired. Throat irritation, sinus problems, high blood pressure, muscle aches and pains, forgetfulness. Oh yeah, it was convenient, right? You didn't want to do it. But you really didn't even remember you were asked to do it. Recall problems. Not just the elderly recall problems. And then breathing difficulties, eyes burning, joint pain, decreased vision, and sleep disorders. And see the percentage. We're still over 30% of the population having these impacts. This is a huge portion of the population. Now we move to 25%. Difficulty in concentrating, inability to recall numbers, ringing in the ears, difficulty in hearing, severe headaches, tingling in the hands, reduced muscle strength, and loss of sexual drive, which nobody wants to talk about. But 25% of the individuals surveyed had these impacts. So let's look at a community living within 50 feet to 2 miles from compressor stations and gas metering stations. How many of you are involved in one of the fights on the compressor station or the gas metering stations? OK, so pay attention to these. Okay, 61% of the health impacts that you'll see on the next slide were associated with chemicals in the air in excess of what's called short and long-term effect screening level. So it exceeded these effect screening levels and was associated with these health impacts. 61%. Nasal irritation exceeded, throat irritation exceeded, eyes burning, 
frequent nausea, allergies, sinus, bronchitis, persistent cough, shortness of breath, increased fatigue, headaches, frequent nosebleeds, sleep disturbances, joint pain, difficulty in concentrating, nervous system impacts, irregular heartbeat, strokes, dizziness, forgetfulness, and easy bruising. These are really, really important to know that these are the health impacts associated with air concentrations over acceptable levels by compressor and metering stations. So you live, you don't live by a well, you just live by a compression station. How much better off are you are? Not necessarily, because the toxic emissions that come from the compressor stations are very toxic to the humans living in the area, and again, air pathway. And here's the rest of the list. Weakness, sores and ulcers in the mouth, urinary infections, decreased motor skills, brain disorders, amnesia, severe anxiety, precancerous lesions, thyroid problems. So you can think you have a really good health, and then a compressor station or a metering station moves in, and your health starts degrading. And then all of a sudden, you wake up one day and realize you're very, very sick, and you have a compressor station as a neighbor. So these are the most prevalent medical conditions in people living in close proximity to the compressors and metering stations. Respiratory impact, 71% of the people has respiratory impacts. Sinus problems, throat irritation, allergies, weakness and fatigue, and eye irritation. More than half the population has at least these. And then we move down the list, nasal, breathing difficulties, vision, severe headaches, sleep disturbance, frequent irritation. Oh, you're just tired, go take a nap and everything will be fine. And then the frequent irritation just goes on and on and on. So what kind of units are there at a compressor station and gas metering stations? The compressor engines, so emissions come from the compressor engines. The compressor blowdowns. I looked at one compressor station application and it had one blowdown a year when they tested the emergency system here in Pennsylvania. I have these kind of units in Texas that have, quote, calculated based on a number like 20 a year, and after the first half a month in the year, they've already exceeded that. So they, what happens is they have a problem, they vent to the air, and they call it blowdown. And sometimes they have five or six problems in a day, and they vent to the air. And that all very toxic chemicals are being released into the air. And if there's more than one compressor at the location, if something goes wrong, it may impact the other compressors and they start venting to the air. These are blowdowns. These don't count as part of their permitted emissions, which are minor source. If you start adding up the emissions from the blowdowns, it will usually make it a major source facility. But again, they don't count, so it's still going to be a minor source facility, which gets a quick permit or even gets a permit without having a public notice or public hearing. Then you have the condensate tanks. This area is not wet, but other areas are, so other areas would have the condensate tanks. The hatch is open, and if you go by with an uh, IR camera, you can see it leaking out of a whole bunch of different locations. And then the truck loading racks, if you have condensate, they haul it off in trucks. The glycol dehydration units is a big issue because it uses glycol to dry the gas, to take the moisture out of the gas so that when they put it in the pipeline, it's dry gas. And one of the major emitters from a glycol dehydration unit is benzene. I have a cancer cluster of leukemia in a rural area and the commonalities are they all live near an agricultural field. It's in their front yard, backyard. And a lot of the ag people use diesel and put the pesticides in diesel when they spray it so it sticks to the plant. 
they all drink from shallow water wells, whether it's individual water wells or municipal system. And the third thing is they all have glycol dehydration units in their area. And yet the agencies at the state and federal level couldn't figure out what the commonalities were for this benzene cluster. Then you have the amine units, which have horrible emissions, and then the separators, and then the fugitive emissions. The fugitives are wherever valves or flanges come together, any kind of connector. It's, and the minute you put one in, the manufacturer tells you how much it's going to leak from the very beginning. And so you have all of these points of fugitive emissions coming from all kind of connectors and the vents out of the top of the tanks. So 90% of the individuals that live near these kind of facilities report experiencing odor events from these facilities. So if you report an odor event, does that mean the chemical made it from the facility to your nose? Yes. Does that mean you were exposed through inhalation? Yes. And what agency do you report an odor event to? The environmental agency. And will they come out? maybe in three days, five days? And will they find what the, caused the odor event? Not by the time they get out. But 90% of the people living near facilities report odor events. So the health effects of community members living near a natural gas storage and processing tank form. Acute health effects, short term, irritation of the skin, eyes, nose, mouth, throat, and lungs headaches, dizziness, lightheadedness, nausea, and vomiting. And I know you're hearing the same health impacts over and over again, but these people who live in these areas are very sick and they're very tired of having these health impacts. And then the chronic anemia, cancer, and leukemia gets back to the benzene. So in the Barnett Shale where Calvin and Tim used to live, but live off the Barnett now, we had a location in a residential area that was going to be, quote, a sm small single stage frack job in February of this year. The company assured the community over and over and over again that there would be no air emissions, no air emissions. So the company had a consultant, which he was also supposed to be the consultant for the local government. And he went in and did sampling. He found the emissions from the flowback water were 20% methane. The air contained 20% methane from the emissions from the flowback water. Remember the flow down, frack, and back up. The volatile organic chemicals were at eight parts per million. And one of the frack tanks, that's those funny looking sideways tanks that they hauled to the frack job, it had the open hatches and it released methane and volatile organic. Remember, no emissions. During the fracking process itself, the consultant found xylene, toluene, ethyl benzene, nitrous oxide in the air. During fracking and flowback operations, he found benzene, again, known human cancer causing agent, the three isomers of xylene, toluene, ammonia, and nitrous oxide. So he made a recommendation to the company that they needed to improve emission capture and removal of VOC emissions during fracking and flowback. This is the same company that told the community zero emissions. So the company had told the community zero emissions, and of course the community didn't believe it. So they raised enough money in the neighborhood to take their own canisters and have them analyzed. So they did an air sample on a day during the fracking from 1,700 feet from the well. And they found benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, xylene, carbon disulfide in excess of the short term and the long term, 20 times the long term, naphthalene, polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbon, exceeded it long term by 7.6 times. There were also two other sets of samples on two other days, and they contained the similar types of chemicals. So can the community make a difference if they have enough money to raise to do their own sampling? Yes. But guess what? The industry said 
the community's data was not appropriate. You kill the messenger, you don't deal with the message. The community basically found the same chemicals the consultant did. The consultant made the recommendation to control those emissions, but this is the neighborhood who was told zero emissions. Now, if you were a company and you had told the neighbors that, wouldn't you have done everything in your power to control emissions unless you knew it didn't matter? So let's look at the chemicals that we've detected in water associated with shale gas drilling, production, and distribution. And I do another presentation on the need for pre-drilling water sampling and what parameters you should look for and how frequently you should look for it and how far out. Because when you put a well pad in place, they drill down and out, and the horizontal can go out two miles, and they put them out in all directions, so you have basically a four-mile circle that's impacted. And frequently they'll say, oh, just look at the wells within 50 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet. But you really need to cover the whole area where they're going to be doing the fracking. So these are the compounds we found in groundwater as a result of drilling, production, and distribution. So when the industry says there's no trace on contamination, drilling, production, and distribution, these are the chemicals. Petroleum hydrocarbons, chloride, and chloride's one of the markers because it's a high salt content and comes out of the produced water. Nitrate, sulfate, 2-butoxyethanol, that's the chemical they found in pavilion and associated back to fracking and a whole host of others, and then the gases, the methane, the fluoride, the nitrite, the arsenic, remember, heavy metal, it's not going anywhere, bisphenol A. All of these chemicals we have detected as a result of drilling, production, and distribution. So what chemicals have we found in the air? Benzene, known human cancer-causing agent, 1,3-butadiene, butyl alcohol, carbon disulfide, carbonyl sulfide, chlorobenzene, chloromethane, diethylbenzene, ethylbenzene, a lot of the associated benzene comp, ethylene oxide, formaldehyde, known human cancer-causing agent, methylpyridine, naphthalene, a polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbon that's just been designated as a cancer-causing agent, toluene, and it goes down the list. So when they say they're not contaminating the water and they're not contaminating the air, the issues are we have the proof they are contaminating the water and they are contaminating the air. And we're finding it out in distances out to at least two miles. So looking at Pennsylvania, working with Earthworks, I developed with Nadia Steinzer, who is the uh, OGAP organizer for the Marcellus, a survey instrument, and then Nadia took it around. So we're currently working on a study of the types and extent of health symptoms experienced by people living in the gas patch of Pennsylvania. This is the same type of community hazard research we have performed in Texas and Wyoming, and some of you saw us at the Philadelphia OGAP Earthworks meeting, and we had presented some of those results at that time. In Pennsylvania, we have surveyed residents in a number of counties, and we're also doing air and water testing at some targeted households. So we will have health symptoms, and then we will have the water and the air results in those household areas. So in January this year, I did a presentation in New York, and at that time I had partial data on the Pennsylvania surveys. And so, as part of that, I did a summary of the Pennsylvania survey as it was at that time. And odor events had been documented as occurring from one, two, three, four, or seven days per week. Can you imagine living with odor events up to seven days a week? We also documented as frequently as 10 to 30 days a month. Is that where you want to live? 
in that kind of community? Is that what you want to welcome in to your community? The odor events have been associated with gas well operations, with condensate tanks, with flaring events, compressor stations, impoundments, leaking pipelines, and underground gas storage formations. The odors associated with the odor events were documented by the participants as rotten eggs, chemical smells, sulfur odors, chlorine, ammonia, sour gas, unpleasant odor, sweet smell, burning smell, and petrochemical smells. And the most prevalent health impacts with the odor events were headaches, difficulty breathing, burning and sore throats, irritated and burning eyes, dizziness, nausea, nosebleeds, and irritated and burning noses. So based on our preliminary assessment of where we are in the survey and we're evaluating the data right now, it's similar pattern to what's going on in other places that we've already documented. And it's exposure to the chemical and toxic substances with shale gas, such as the chemicals that are released from wells, compressor stations, and waste pits. And the symptoms consist of respiratory, skin, joint, and other types of problems that you've heard me say over and over and over again tonight. The closer the individual lives to the facility, the more frequent and worse their health symptoms appear to be. The closer they live, the more frequent and worse their health symptoms appear to be. Many individuals report feeling better when they are away from their home. And this happens a lot. If they leave and go visit relatives, or they leave and go on a business trip, all of a sudden they go like, I feel so much better now that I'm away. And then when they come back after a few hours of being home, it starts picking up again. We'll complete the study and the report, and we'll have detailed data, findings, and recommendations. And we hope to have it out by the end of summer. The same kind of health impacts that occur in states nationwide are being experienced here in Pennsylvania. So you are not alone. And unless action is taken to reduce community exposure, things will only get worse. So you can fight the wells, you can fight the compressor stations, you can fight the metering stations, you can fight the pipelines. But when you lose, you need to be sure as much exposure reduction is built in as possible. Because if you have to have it, you want it the smallest amount of emissions as possible. These are not potential problems of the future. The health impacts are occurring now in Pennsylvania. So the shale gas development has resulted in human health impacts to a large number of individuals living and working in the area of shale development and going to school as well. Large quantities of environmental damage and disturbance have resulted. State regulatory programs that are not adequate to regulate and control the rapidly developing shale technology being implemented within the individual states. And I actually go around as a multi-stakeholder process and review state programs. And they are severely lacking to regulate it. The technology has taken off. Some argue not appropriately. But the state regulatory program can't keep up with the technology. They lack sufficient personnel at the state level to inspect, monitor, and enforce the existing rails. And for years, I've reviewed, I think I've reviewed Pennsylvania's programs four times. And one of the issues is they don't have enough field staff. And when shale gas and the Marcellus started, they took field staff and brought them into the central office to review and write permits. So there was even less people out in the field making sure the right things were occurring. And Earthworks has performed studies of enforcement in Colorado, Texas, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New Mexico. And we're in the process of releasing those enforcement reports. But the results demonstrate that enforcement is severely lacking. So even if you have the best set of regs, if they're not enforced, they don't exist. And local governments have the authority to regulate, except in Pennsylvania. The siting of oil and gas wells, compressor stations, tank batteries, 
States are attempting to take the local government authority away, and in fact, here, they have taken it away. And in Texas, I've worked with a lot of the counties to develop ordinances, and what happens is a company will come in and apply for a permit, and they'll ask for 20 variations or variances. And when the zoning committee stands up and says no, then the industry says we'll sue you. And so the legal guy goes like, whoa, we don't have the money for that kind of suit. We can't handle that kind of suit. We don't have the resources. So they grant them the permit and the variances. So it becomes a political issue. Meanwhile, the community is suffering. Um, basically what this is, a couple of months ago, Wilma said about the, uh, the company coming in and saying that there are no emissions that are coming off the facility. That's just not in Louisiana or New York. That's right here. Uh, this is something I videotaped a couple of months ago just up the road in Monroe Township. Um, most of you probably have seen the Beaumont Inn if you drive up Route 29. There's a glycol uh, dehydration station being built right across the street. Uh, this is a concerned parent who has kids with asthma. Ask the, uh, the chief representative from Chief Gathering with his lawyer sitting right next to him. Uh, are there harmful chemicals and emissions coming off this facility? I uh, sent this to Wilma, and she'll tell you what is actually coming out of this, but this is a clip from that presentation. Are you aware if the um, burn off is irritating to the eyes or the throat or the skin at the time that I would have to say no. Okay. And do you, do you know if it has any um, asthmatic inducing effects? Like if someone were to have asthma that lives right there? I don't believe it does. Okay. We had to look at the MSDS on that. The what? Material safety data sheet. And is you, that? You can find online. Anywhere. Online? Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that like a general thing or you mean like your... Like it's cheap? a general, it's a natural occurring product that I guess people use. You can find uh, ethyl mercaptan on the web. Under. Oh, I mean the MSD sheet. Is that like just a generic sheet that's used, or is that a, a, on the chief website you mean? No, it would be a, just on the general web. Okay. If you wanted to review a MSD sheet in general. Okay. And um, do you, are you aware? I, I had asked uh, about a variety of different things: methane, benzene, the toiling, or, or formaldehyde. None of those will be there, or well, of course, methane will be there because well, yeah, that yes, but uh, um, the gas doesn't contain benzene, okay? No benzene, to toluene, toluene shouldn't have any in it, and no. formaldehyde, no formaldehyde either. So, this is a general permit, which is a minor permit, which now doesn't require a public notice or a public comment period. So, you see the same type of chemicals we've been talking about the volatile organics. And this is pounds per hour and tons per year, 1.48 tons. Nitrous oxide, which is a precursor to ozone, you see over 11 tons a year. Carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, a known human cancer causing agent. Total hazardous air pollutants and particulate matter. And we saw lots of particulate matter today. And again, these are some of the units on the facility. So they sit there and go, there's no emissions, or it'll be small emissions. They're not dangerous. And we would like a small minor permit. Except now they don't have to do that because there's a new reg that just went in that says they don't even have to put a public notice or they don't have to give you a public comment period. So it's a done deal. They apply for it, they get their permit, and they start building, and you won't know anything about it. So that issue is really important to the people in Pennsylvania to be able to have at least a public notice and decide whether or not you want to comment on these compressor stations, wells, metering stations, and the whole thing. Thank you. What do you know about the situation in Assumption Parish in Louisiana? 
bubbles and boiling in the bayou, tremors, storage domes involved, called dummies, I don't know. And what is the difference between produced water and flowback? Wait, what was that? Let me do the assumption one. Sure. One first. Assumption, not to worry. It's just a lot of poor people that live there. There is what's called the Napoleonville Salt Dome. We have fingers of salt. You have actually deposits of salt. And in our fingers of salt, the industry puts storage caverns. And there's something like 12 storage caverns in the Napoleonville Dome. And one of them was originally permitted and constructed by Dow Chemical. And then when they didn't need it anymore, they sold it off. And about five years ago, the material that was being stored in that dome leaked. And it leaked both underground and to the surface. And there were a large number of very poor people's houses on top of it. And the houses acted like tents. And so there were explosive levels in the people's houses. They evacuated the people out of the area. They shut down the road, which was Highway 70. And then they couldn't figure out where it all had gone, but it was underground and continuing to leak into the surface. So the company had to buy those people out and move them away. And when you go by now, you see just slabs. So this same finger of salt, the Napoleonville Salt Dome, is apparently causing bubbling on Bayou Corn and Grand Bayou. And the people had noticed it bubbling. They called the agency, which is the Office of Conservation. And then the Office of Conservation went out and called the Department of Environmental Quality and said, we need help. And so there was two transmission pipelines going under Bayou Corn, which was the first thing they tried to blame, that the pipeline was leaking. So the pipeline company came in and excavated around them. And instead of just like six points, when they excavated, it just spread out. So, but it wasn't the pipeline. The pipeline company also reduced the pressure, thinking if it was them, if they reduced the pressure in the pipeline, it wouldn't bubble as fast. And it was bubbling just as fast. So they know it's one of the storage domes. And two of the domes, two of the caverns in the dome store methane. The others are brine solution to make chlorine. So one of them is shut in, and the other one, they're trying to figure out and take a sample. But you know how it is. It takes forever to get a sample done. But clearly, they know it's bubbling in Bayou Con and Grand Bayou, but they haven't started looking at the houses. They put up some monitors out, and one of the methane levels went up to 25%. So you know what they did? Kill the messenger. They accused the community of going by and putting a methane source to make the monitor go high. But they're getting ready to buy another whole host of homes, relocate the people, and the trimmers are all are coming from the salt, and that finger of salt has all kind of fractures, and so we're thinking that's where the trimmers are coming from. And it's not going to make the industry really happy because they want to be able to continue to use the Napoleonville Dome to dissolve salt and make chlorine. But this is what happens when you have underground storage in salt, either caverns in a finger of salt or in a formation. And the other question was, what is the difference between produced water and flowback? Okay, produced water is what is in the formation where oil and gas resides. And when you bring oil and gas to the surface, you bring the produced water with it. Usually the older the well, the more produced water comes to the surface and the less oil and gas. So you have stripper wells that produce a barrel of oil a month and a thousand barrels of produced water. Flowback water is the hydraulic fracturing fluid you put down to crack over the formation that picks up some contaminants from the formation and flows back to the surface. That makes sense? Yeah, I have two questions here that are pretty much related. Uh, one is, uh, the question is, is there any monitor, any air monitor, a citizen living around shell activities can wear to document chemical exposure? 
And a similar question is, how can people figure out what short-term or long-term screening levels are for different pollutants? Does the state have to consider these levels of exposure when approving air permits? Okay, the monitor is the kind that you wear a badge. A lot of the industry people require a monitor, and it's for a specific chemical that they may be having on that facility. You can uh, wear one of those. It'll give you a concentration over time of what you've been exposed to. But usually they're designed for one chemical or one class of chemical, where in this case you have a large number. But at least it gives you an idea of whether or not you're being exposed. And the other one, um, the each state, OK, Louisiana has ambient air standards we adopted in the late 80s. And we were able to hold on to those ambient air standards. And it deals with the chemicals from the petrochemical facilities, which is oil and gas base. Each state has looked at some like long term and short term. In Texas, I don't know if uh, Calvin talked to you about it, but they established long term and short term. And every time we get a value that would exceed, then they would jack up the concentrations. So it wasn't something that you had to go to the legislature and have a legislative hearing and a technical hearing on. It was just numbers that they developed. And when they didn't like because we showed them it was exceeding, they ratcheted it up. But you can look at each state's, each state's requirements for long and short term exposure for ambient air standards. I had the EPA examine my spring due to fragging in my area. The result was negative. Can I trust the EPA? <laughs> Compared to the state agencies? I would trust them a lot more than the state agencies. But no one is infallible. So the issue is you have to work with them. You have to tell them what your issues are, what your problems are. And if they're going to come in and do sampling, you need to be part of that sampling. They may not allow you to go on the site if they go in on a site. But you can be right there at the fence watching. And then you can get the data from them. And then you can have somebody evaluate the data. Anybody that is willing to help you accumulate data, you need to work with. Because data accumulation is very, very expensive. Okay, we have a technical question now. Does the technology exist to make compressor emissions safe? If so, what would it be? What is it? You can put scrubbers and different types of control mechanisms on any type of piece of equipment. You just have to be sure that it is controlling all of the emissions. The compressors that they use are a lot better today than they used to be, but their emissions are still horrendous. And then when you permit a compressor station, you have all the blowdowns, you have all the fugitive emissions. So you're not only just looking at the compressor, but you're looking at the blowdowns, the fugitive emissions, and if you have a glycol dehydration unit. But they can do things to control it. But as long as they're a minor source permit, there is no requirement and no push by the state agency to control the emissions. So that's something the community has to push for on a particular compressor station that might be looking to site in your area. Uh, another question is, how can people with existing health issues supposed to distinguish between their existing problems and what may be brought on by all of these uh, new chemicals? Sure. So in the surveys that we've done as part of Earthworks and in all the surveys that I've done with communities around different types of facilities, I always ask, what kind of health impacts did you have prior to something new coming in? So they can tell you what they had before and then what they had afterwards. Also, a lot of times, they'll have pre-existing conditions that are worsened when the facility or the event occurs. So you ask enough of those questions to determine what you had before. Is it worse, or is it different? And are the different health impacts associated specifically with the chemicals? Uh, another question deals with uh, the Clean Water Act. Why isn't it effective at protecting reservoirs? And a related question is, how will fracking affect the health of the Chesapeake Bay? OK, give me the first one again. Uh, why, why, is isn't it, why, isn't why isn't it effective at protecting reservoirs? 
It depends on which agency is enforcing it. The Clean Water Act usually deals with releases into the environment from point sources, and it also has part of the regulation dealing with um, area sources and sheet runoff. And it becomes an issue or a non-issue if you have a water body that's in non-attainment. But if you don't have that water body in non-attainment but it's still contaminated, nobody's going to go in and try and enforce the Clean Water Act. And let me give you this example. We have a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico the size of New Jersey, which is a result of nutrients flowing down the Mississippi River. And the major nutrients are from agricultural runoff, from fertilizer applications, and uh, feedlots. None of, the none of the states want to deal with the material. They want to let it run off. The I states, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, are the worst culprits. And yet, when you try and deal with the ag community in those states and talk about what impact it's having on the Gulf of Mexico and the fisheries resources, they don't want to hear it. So even though you have rules and regs on the book, it's how it is or is not enforced at both the federal level and the state level. Well, that's great, because that leads up to the next question. First of all, you have a compliment. Thanks for the information. Uh, regulations are a failure. Political action, actions are failing. What are we going to do about it? And related to that, they are asking, in your opinion, do you think that the federal government should step up to the plate and impose tougher regulations for the natural gas, comp uh, gas industry, regulating air and water emissions? How can we accomplish this? In other words, what can we do? Okay, so should the, the federal government implement regulations? Again, in the late 80s, it was decided that the oil and gas industry would be regulated by the states. And the federal government has regulated things like some merc mercury emissions from certain things. But they just released those air emission rules dealing with the green completion of wells. Nobody agrees that it was enough, but the issue was they took the step and did issue regulations on air emissions from shale gas production, which was a big, big deal that industry didn't like. Talk to Chamber of Commerce meetings. Talk to civic clubs, Kiwanis, Rotary. Talk to church organizations. Get the word out. Because people need to know, one, when it's coming to the area, what to expect. And then, two, you need as broad a base as possible when you're educating the polit political officials. But it's up to you to bring that message to them and tell them what you want. You either don't want it there, you want reduced emissions, you want it. I've, I've been hearing people say, well, they moved it over a little bit so it wasn't near his property or moved it over a little bit, wasn't near the, his house or that school. So you've made progress. You haven't lost it all. But it's up to you to uh, educate those elected officials. And when they come up for re-election, start asking the tough questions of their position. I told you we have an injection well hearing on Thursday. We have some re-elections coming up. And the senators and the representatives were at the community meeting preparing for that public hearing and supporting the community. A year ago, they would not have been there because they weren't up for re-election. So take advantage of the re-election and ask them the tough questions. Where do they stand? What will they support? Will they be behind you or not? You have to make that push to get better regulations, enforce regulations. Look at the OGAP report that's coming out on the Pennsylvania enforcement and see what's really happening at the state level in your area. See where the state is not enforcing the regs that are on the books. You can agree or disagree that the regs aren't adequate enough, but if they're not being enforced, you're totally losing because that's what you have and it desperately needs to be enforced. So work on the issues, get as much information out to the communities as possible, get it out in small chunks. You don't want to overwhelm somebody with a 20-page document that you're going to ask them to read that they won't read. Do it in fact sheets, two-sided pages, and educate them, and work towards educating your elected officials. Very wise, wise uh, ideas, which all take to heart. 
because especially our elected officials hate a lot of bad press. And if we could get it to them and really keep it in front of them, hopefully we may be able to get some of these uh, objectives taken care of. It will take a long time, folks. It's not going to happen overnight. A run for election. Because a lot of the communities I work with, they realized after they were involved that the people they elected that they thought were looking out for their interests weren't. So they started running for offices. There's one, one more question, I guess. It says, Louisiana was the original whistleblower in regard to radiation <laughs> brought to the surface. What data is now available on radioactivity? Anything else in the back? No, that's what they were asking. Home state. First of all, the industry has known since the 30s, 1930s, that they had a radiation problem and they knew about how much of a problem it was. Louisiana was the first state to put forth regulations. Now remember, we're an oil and gas state. And so what we were able to accomplish was a reporting of where all the radiation sites were, all the wells, all the pipe yards, all the compressor stations, all the glycol dehydration units, wherever they knew they had radiation. When the agencies reported it, the estimate was it was 10% of the locations. But at least we had something to start to go into these communities and say, these are the known radiation problems in your area. We went into some of the other states, and the agencies would go like, we don't have that problem here. We're still coming up against that when we review state programs. We don't have a radiation problem here. If you ask them to start documenting it, you suddenly find out they do. In the Marcellus, it's a big deal. The industry will tell you it's a big deal. So keep pushing for as much of that information. The information on what it is in the formation that they are drilling and producing should be public information. Go to the agencies and ask to see the information on their norm, naturally occurring radioactive material, surveys of the well sites and the pipelines and the glycol dehydration units and the oil water separators and the condensate separators. The tank bottoms are particularly high in concentration because it comes as a scale and it'll settle out in the tank bottoms. And then all of a sudden you see the tank bottom being hauled to your local landfill with the radiation in it because they forget, they forget that they can't go to a landfill if it's radiation. I got a call one day from a guy and he wouldn't tell me his name. He told me where he lived basically and he said that he had gotten a bunch of piping from a compressor station that was being decommissioned and it had been surveyed for Norm. And so he bought this pipe and he went home and he bought, he built fences and corrals and gates. And then he said one day he decided to do his honeydew list and he picked up all the pieces in the yard. When he brought it to the scrap yard to sell it, it set off the radiation detector. The piping he had bought still had the scale in it and he had actually scooped out the scale before he did the wells. And then the scale he had stooped out, he used like gravel to pave a road. And he was freaking out because he saw his whole property radioactive. So I told him what he had to do, to who he had to contact, and I never heard back from him again. And I'm hoping he did the right thing and is not still being exposed to the radiation he knows is on his property. 